Father Tom Anneking, Conventional Prior, Crozier Fathers and Brothers, has the introduction uh, of our speakers today. Go ahead, Father Tom. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, good uh, Rotary afternoon to all of you. Of the introductions I have, it's information that I received from each of the participants in the uh, debate today. Phil Boas is the editorial page director at the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. He has served on the paper's editorial board since 1999. Thank Senator you. Kate Brophy McGee has earned her reputation as a trailblazer and someone who puts her constituents and Arizona ahead of party politics. She has served her community for nearly two decades, first as a school board member and in the Arizona State Legislature for the past 10 years. During that time, she's won numerous awards for her landmark legislative work. Most recently, Kate was awarded best elected official in the state of Arizona for an unprecedented two years running in 2019 and 2020. And Christine Marsh is a proud Phoenician and graduate of Arizona Public Schools. After attending UCLA on a track scholarship, she made the decision to come back home to Phoenix, where she raised her two sons and six foster children, and where she is in her 29th year as an English teacher. In 2016, after over two decades of teaching, Christine was honored to be named Arizona's Teacher of the Year. Through that experience, she had the opportunity to travel the state and see firsthand the issues that public schools face. Well, welcome to the District 28 State Senate debate and welcome to our candidates, Christine Marsh and Kate Brophy McGee. We'll have uh, opening remarks of about two and a half minutes each for both candidates. And I'll start in with questions about the issues. We'll try to cover a, a lot of ground quickly here in a short amount of time. So we'll kick off with Kate Brophy McGee since she won the coin flip. And Kate, why don't you start us with your comments? Thank you very much. And I couldn't help but start with the four-way test. I carry it with me down to the Capitol and put it to the best use I know how. So it's such an honor to be here. So as you know, I've been in the legislature for 10 years. And I wanted to really focus in on health care, which is top of mind for many Arizonans. And also because you might have noticed that there are mail pieces hitting your mailboxes and landing on your doorsteps that... Uh, make claims such as me voting to kick people with pre-existing conditions off their health insurance. And I'm here to reiterate that that is absolutely categorically patently false. Let me explain. In my 10 years in the legislature, I've worked with the healthcare community and healthcare organizations across the state very closely. I'm endorsed by every single one of them. And we have done monumental, amazing work to me. So a work together. So it kind of flies in the face of logic that I would be wanting to kick people off their insurance because of pre-existing conditions. Far from that, I have been a champion of getting Arizona's quality, affordable uh, health care. And I'll start back in 2012 with the cancer bill that I sponsored that gained 550 women and two men year to date were uninsured or underinsured care for their uh, breast cancer uh, and also cervical cancer. In 2014, 13, I led the charge on kids on Medicaid expansion. I stood with Governor Brewer and a minority of Republicans to make that happen here in this state. In 2015, uh, 16, I led the charge on kids care. And again, this last session, two sessions ago, uh, I led the charge. We have kids care here in Arizona and we are funding it. In addition, I've done a lot of work around surprise billings. And in 2019, I passed legislation called Association Health Plans, which allows small businesses to band together like large businesses and buy quality affordable health insurance, just like Motorola or Intel would. And for that, I received the Senator of the Year Award, Tech Senator of the Year Award, uh, given to me by the Arizona Tech Council. So 
um, the Affordable Care Act is a federal law and it prohibits discrimination against people with existing pre-existing conditions. And in 2017, I worked and lobbied John McCain for that famous no vote. So I wanted to make it very clear that um, I care about people with pre-existing conditions and I work to cover them. Okay. Uh, Christine, it's your turn. All right. Thank you all for being here. And it's an honor to be part of this. I've been looking forward to this chance to introduce myself to you. I'm Christine Marsh. I'm the 2016 Arizona Teacher of the Year, and I'm running for State Senate and Legislative District 28. While my experiences as a mother, teacher, and foster mother certainly helped me make the decision to run for State Senate, my primary motivation for running is my belief that the state could be doing better. Through my experiences as Teacher of the Year, I listened to teachers and community members from all over the state and saw firsthand the challenging issues that our communities and our public schools are facing. Uh, and those issues are directly related, connected to the de decisions that the legislature makes. Uh, for too long, Arizona has suffered under the burden of one party rule. Our health care access has been threatened, including access to care for people with pre existing conditions. The COVID 19 pandemic has hit Arizona way too hard. Our infrastructure is crumbling. Our voting rights are being systematically taken away. Our kids' classes have gotten larger and there are a few counselors available in our schools. Uh, and a more balanced Senate will, be, will allow beneficial ideas from both sides of the aisle to get a fair hearing with public input, which will benefit all Arizonans. Uh, and really it's time for a change. Uh, let's ensure that all children have access to equitable educational opportunities and that all Arizonans have the, op the, you know, the options for quality, affordable health care. And again, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the, the first issue we're going to go into has probably been the most important issue in Arizona over the last half decade, and that is education. It also happens to be probably the driving force for both of you to get into state politics. And um, so I want to I want to ask about education funding. And Christine, we'll start with you. Um, both of you have argued strongly for more funding for public education. What what needs to happen next on the funding front? And how does the passage or defeat of invest in ed factor into that? So we really, we need to increase the funding. And uh, as a legislator, I think that it's, you know, I mean, from a legislator's point of view uh, or a candidate for a le legislative position, I think it's heartbreaking that our state's education funding crisis came to this. I mean, Prop 208 was a direct result of legislatures not fulfilling their duties, their responsibility to fund schools. And we should not have to raise taxes to fund schools. We do not have, we don't have to raise taxes to fund schools. But given the difficult choice that, you know, so many community, many, bleh, community members face between raising income taxes on some people and keeping education funding where years of bad budgets have left it. The voters took matters into their own hands and you know, got the signatures required to run it as a ballot initiative. Uh, and I, you know, I, that is going to be absolutely crucial funding for our schools as we are, you know, the bottom of the barrel is, uh, you know, we're at the bottom of the barrel in so many metrics when it comes to education, bottom line. Kate, what about you? What, what needs to happen next on funding public education? Well, I think it, to put it into context, uh, we need to consider where we were versus where we now are. And between 2015, a budget I voted against, and 2020, we have invested 
new or restored dollars uh, totaling over $4.5 billion into K-12 education. Um, that includes the 20 by 20 uh, teachers raises, that includes Prop 123, and uh, the legislative extension of Prop 301 that Doug Coleman and I figured out a way to make happen when everybody told us it wasn't going to happen. And just this past year alone, legis you know, Prop 301 put over $800 million into Arizona schools. All that being said, more must be done. And my vision is a P20 system. I'll start K20, but I truly want to go back and pick up early childhood and systematic funding, and you know that I have put forward the proposal of the penny sales tax as an alternative uh, to um, income tax that will just harm small businesses horrendously. So I think there's a lot of work to do. I think uh, I'm exactly the person to go down there and continue the work that I have been involved in for the last 10 years and leading the charge on. Um, we can get there, but what we have to do is quit going back and beating everybody up for the dearth of funding and pull together and, and also quit voting no on stuff because it's not enough. Quit letting perfect be the enemy of good and incrementally move the state forward in education funding. It is continues to be a primary goal of mine. Kate, the next question picks up from there and I'll start with you. And that is, there, the, the state has not sat pat. I mean, the state has been putting more and more money into education. The Democrats would argue that, yeah, they did with the push of Red for Ed and teacher strikes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a larger philosophical question here, and that is, when is enough enough? How will we know we're properly funding public education? Is there a magic number to hit is it restoration to pre-recession per pupil funding? What, what is it? You know, I have been asking that question for 20 years, for my 10 years on the school board and my 10 years in the legislature. What I do know um, is that the educational choice has to be adequately funded. It has not been adequately funded and that's why I and my colleagues, uh, Republican and Democrat have fought so hard for increased funding. But I think in, there is a sweet spot there and you need to provide accountability uh, to the taxpayers who are in fact funding this P20 system um, so that we can um, demonstrate that our children are learning and succeeding and growing. I will tell you that right now what's being left out of the conversation and I've been fighting to get back into the conversation is community colleges and universities. University funding has not been restored, the, and, and the state's share and role in that is too small, and we have two large community college systems that are not at all funded. So lots of work to do. I just know we are not there yet, and there's more to be done, and I also truly believe, as always, I'm the person to lead that charge. Christine, what, what do you think we're going to need to do to, to reach success? What level do we have to be at at funding? Well, I think uh, one metric would be we'll know when we are, you know, at least heading in the right direction when we're funding education to an extent that we actually move out of 49th. I mean, the, you know, the 20 by 20, 20 plan brought us from 49th all the way to 49th, and I live every day what 49th actually looks like. Uh, and I think that one other metric that will, will, where we'll, when we'll know that we've reached, you know, at least heading in the right direction of enough funding will be when we can actually attract and retain teachers, uh, when we can actually have a stable teaching force. Because to me, that lack of, teachers, that teacher shortage is really about kids. I mean, I can get a different job. Most teachers can, and unfortunately they do. But our kids are the ones who are left in classrooms with uncertified teachers or big classes, huge class sizes, or whatever it might be. I mean, and it's really not, we all talk about it being a teacher shortage 
but it's actually really not a teacher shortage because we have tens of thousands of certified teachers in Arizona who simply won't teach. Uh, but, you know, I mean, at any given time, it's somewhere around 2,000 that we are short. And you've got to mentally multiply that out to, you know, really get a good number on the kids who are feeling those consequences, who are facing those consequences. So, you know, I think that uh, actually moving from, you know, the bottom of the nation and being able to actually keep teachers in the workforce, would it be at least two metrics in the proper direction? And this is about triage. So we've got to really solve these bigger, you know, these big issues before we can delve down and get into some of the other ones. Let, let me ask another education no. question. Oh, go ahead, did you? Can, can I add into that? Yeah, quickly, yeah. Uh, very quickly, oh. I appreciate what the, the metrics that Christine put on the table. The Arizona teacher salary has gone from 48,000 in year 2017 to 52,000 in 2019, and it will go higher this next year. We also have the Teachers Academy, and it is producing a second in the nation in producing teachers ready to go to work in our school over 600. That got started in 2017. It was a suggestion of Fred Duvall's, and it's working very well. You can't fix it immediately. You have to incrementally fix it. Thank you. Christine, and just to give you an opportunity for follow-up if you want one. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, pay maybe has gone up. Uh, I don't see it. My pay does not reach the top of the metrics she just threw out there, and I've been around for 29 years. Uh, but really, if the pay was enough, then we would not still have this incredible teacher shortage. Uh, and our starting teachers start in the low 30s. They start at 33 to 35 thousand a year. Um, a big bottom line, when we have reached some kind of equilibrium within the labor market, within the teaching labor market, that will be, uh, you know, when we know that things are different. But, you know, re the reality is, is that over the, from 20, oh, 2008 to 2015, uh, we've cut 4.56 billion, you know, out of schools. I mean, and we're facing the consequences of it. So it, we uh, we definitely need to be heading in the other direction. When I ran for the school board, I believed that education was the key to every child's success, and no matter what their circumstances are. And I was a huge proponent 20 years ago of school choice, and I continue to be that the of the belief that parents are their child's first and best teachers, and that uh, they deserve the opportunity to choose the best educational setting for their children. The important thing is that these choices must be adequately funded, must be properly overseen, and must ensure that all Arizona children receive an outstanding education. So I do support school choice, and I do support accountabilities and transparency to go with that school choice. I absolutely believe that parents have the option and should have the ability to choose where they want their children to go. Uh, but I think that the lack of accountability in both the charter schools and in the private schools through STOs and ESAs uh, is, is not appropriate. Uh, we don't fund public schools well enough period to then add in this two or even three tiered education system that we currently have going on. But I, you know, I absolutely, I mean, I've seen it in my own public school teaching that there are, you know, there are some children with whatever might be going on that a choice outside of the public school system is best for that child and for their family. Uh, and I support that, but there has to be uh, far, far more accountability uh, and transparency than there currently is.
for both systems, for both charter and private. So what I would add to the charter school discussion is in 2019, I introduced Senate Bill 1394, it made it out of the Senate. It was the first, it was massive reform to the charter school system, accountability, and um, it made it out of the Senate under a completely split vote and then died in the House uh, because uh, my Republican colleagues said it did too much. My Democratic colleagues said it wasn't enough. But what then happened in, co in concert with the 2018 budget where we adopted a financial accountability tool for charter schools, the State Board of Charter Schools went back, picked up all the provisions of 1394, including membership, board training, transparency, procurement, and made it part of that financial accountability tool. So now we have a three-legged stool, and I sponsored legislation doubling the size of the State Board of Charter Schools so that they could, in fact, do school visits on time. They could investigate complaints. And with the three-legged stool of academic, uh, financial, and operational accountability in place, uh, it is a much better arrangement. Those reforms were long overdue, and I was proud to sponsor them. Can each candidate indicate explicitly whether they will vote for or against Prop 208? I will start with Christine. Yes, as a private citizen, I will be voting for 208. But as I said earlier, I think it's a shame that it came to this. It should not have come to this. This, uh, you know, the legislature should not have abdicated basically on their responsibility to properly fund public education. So as a legislator, I would definitely be looking at different avenues. Um, but as a private citizen, I will be voting for it. So um, I think if you're talking as a legislator, you can't really have it both ways. You're either for a tax increase or you're not. And I did advocate for a tax increase, taking the Prop 301.6 sales tax up to a full penny with targeted tax, tax relief towards our low income working families. And I still think that is a valuable tool going forward. 208 is an excellent uh, example of wrong plan, wrong time. And the reason I say that it's the wrong plan is that it will be the largest increase in of taxes, permanent tax increase in Arizona history. Almost 77% tax increase, taking us from one of the lowest taxing states to one of the highest. In addition, it will force on this tax burden onto small businesses who will pay twice as much as a Motorola or an Intel or other large corporations. It is, it completely splits the P20 dynamic that we had going with the renewal of Prop 301. Um, and as far as wrong time, we are just coming out of this horrendous economic and COVID crisis and we wanna do this. We wanna smack our small businesses with this kind of attacks. It's just the wrong time. Uh, we need to do more, absolutely. And I'm prepared to do that. This is not the way. There is a way to separate legislate, being a legislator from a private citizen. I mean, I'm saying that as a legislator, I would not be behind anything that raises taxes, but this was citizens. This was 400,000 or how, whatever the number was of citizens who signed the petition. So there is, there is a difference between how one would operate as a legislator and as a private citizen voting for something that people, you know, went through pandemic and heat in order to get the appropriate signatures. And, you know, the, the 301 that Kate is mentioning is a sales tax. It's a regressive tax, which places the burden on our more impoverished people. Uh, and that is going to affect small businesses. It's going to affect the customers of those small businesses who are already paying far more, a far higher percentage of their income than the more affluent 
than their more affluent counterparts. I mean, everybody has to buy, you know, say milk and paper towels or whatever it is. Uh, so sales tax from a percentage point of view affects our most impoverished far at a, it, it hits them much, much harder. Uh, so I, you know, I, there, it's a difference between a progressive and a regressive tax. And unfortunately, I mean, we shouldn't be in the position where we've got to be raising taxes, period. Um, but I just think it's interesting that, you know, it's coming down between regressive and progressive and who's, who's going for what, who's supporting which one. So as long as we're having this free flowing conversation and Phil still hasn't rejoined us, let me suggest a couple of things. It wasn't quite the grassroots initiative that you'd want to describe. It is very union driven. It's driven by the teachers union who are your biggest backers and biggest supporters. And um, I understand the frustration related to education funding and the things we must do. But I know through my votes and my fights and my efforts over the past 10 years, we lost Democrats on a budget where we made true progress, true, true progress on education funding under the premise that it's not good enough, it doesn't do enough. So it really has been Republican driven the whole time. Imagine what we could do if we could join together as Republicans and Democrats and move the education funding and accountability piece forward. And as far as regressive taxes on low income families, I gotta ask you about your support for the Steyer Initiative, which would in turn, you supported it publicly, would increase utility bills $1,000 on average for Arizona families. And you know who that hits the hardest? That hits our poor, our working poor families, right smack in the nose. And it's just not right. You can't have it one way that it's regressive and another way that it's okay. Uh, so you, I think you're talking Prop 127 from what, two years ago, right? Uh, Correct, it, you supported it. As, uh, you know, as we talked about yesterday, that was so basic that APS did everything that uh, Prop 127 wanted anyway. Uh, and if Prop 127 will double our utility bills, then I've got to, you know, wonder why you're taking money from a company that wants to double our utility bills. I mean, There's I... There's a huge, huge difference because that's not accurate. APS is pursuing clean and renewable energy initiatives. Absolutely. And absolutely they should. But the Steyer Initiative would have shut down the Palo Verde nuclear power plant, which was our largest source of reliable, clean power. And if it had done that, then we would be no better off and probably worse off than California. So the answer is no, we need a mix of blend that in includes the move to clean energy, but also includes reliability and affordability for our poorest consumers. I have a question for the two candidates. The, re the reality of the situation is that Although there are many school districts that are doing a, a, a very impressive job of educating their students, there are failing schools and there are t teachers who ought not to be teaching but to are pre prevented from being terminated because of, of union rules. And one of the innovations to take care of truly low income children who are locked in those failing schools and and what one writer refers to as failure factories is empowerment scholarships where by demonstrating certain economic, an economic need and that the school is performing below a certain level are given the option of arranging for schooling at some other school that may have uh, maybe a private school, maybe a widely privately subsidized school where they can get the, the education they need. And I would like to hear each of the candidates in terms of their views on empowerment scholarships. I would like to backtrack as far as teachers and that there might be poor performing ones. Uh, in order to solve that very important issue, we actually have to have teachers to replace them. And right now we don't. And it really is not unions uh, that prevent poor teachers from, you know, either getting remediation or getting on some kind of an improvement plan. 
uh, it really comes down to often overwhelmed administrators uh, taking care of it. But again, there's you know a warm body. Uh, in some cases, it might be better than nobody. Um, but I do agree that that is a that that is a problem. But you know, I think the Arizona voters already pretty much took care of this whole empowerment scholarship account idea um, with 305 by an overwhelming majority, and I respect that. And we could get into all kinds of, and I would be happy, I can't remember who asked the question, be happy to put my number in the chat and we can, you know, have coffee and really talk about because there are still within the empowerment scholarship account system, there are a lot of inequities and there are still a lot of children left behind. A better option would be to actually fund our public schools to such a level that the poor performing schools and the poor performing children actually had the resources necessary in order to succeed which so much has been cut that we just don't. So Roger, you raised two points, or at least I think that was Roger, that you raised two points, one about teacher performance. And uh, we are a local control state. I was on a school board for 10 years and each district, each charter school, um, each they are responsible for their teacher discipline and the union can have a presence and a role and in some districts that role is not healthy in other districts it's invaluable but it, to go on to empowerment scholarship accounts uh, i and senator then senator bob worsley kept prop 305 on the ballot because there was enormous pressure for us to vote to take it to repeal the legislation statutorily but i think it was important with the people who worked to get it on the ballot it was critical that Arizonans have a vote and they resoundingly said, this is enough in terms of empowerment scholarship accounts. I think we've pretty much covered all the categories, particularly special needs, um, children on Indian reservations. I will tell you that uh, last this last session, uh, I worked with Senator Allen, who's a huge proponent of ESAs, much more so than I, and she, and, and by that, I mean, she wants to take them statewide. And I think the impact on the general fund would be devastating. But we enacted some reforms uh, in working with Superintendent Kathy Hoffman so that she has the chance to appropriately administer those funds, hold the parents accountable, make sure the students are getting what they need. Um, it has, uh, it, they are enormous reforms. We've got to see them through so that parents who, who are using an ESA scholarship can be well served and the taxpayers are protected. So uh, thank you for asking the question. Do you wanna take one minute for a closing statement and, and then we will sign off. First off, thank you for Phoenix Rotary for hosting this event. I really, um, I appreciate being here in my classroom when we're not online, I have my students sit in a circle so that everyone can have a voice and feels valued. And that's bottom line, the mentality that I wanna bring down to the Capitol, letting everyone, regardless of their party, have a voice. There are great ideas on both sides of the aisle on issues like firefighter workers comp protections. Uh, that was from Senator Boyer. Uh, and LGBTQIA non-discrimination from my own opponent, all bills that were prime sponsored by Republicans. But right now, the Republican party is the only party permitted to take part in the governing process. And that's bottom line what I wanna change. I would like to hear good ideas from both sides of the aisle with public hearings and public input um, and like really explore some of the good ideas that we know are out there that right now are just not getting a hearing. But again, I wanna say I appreciate so much for the opportunity to share a little bit about who I am and what I stand for. Um, and I look forward to serving and working and representing all of you. Uh, and you know, hope in the future you invite me back sometime and we can continue this conversation.
very, very quickly, there are reasons to change. Um, and in this instance, I am the most bipartisan legislator down there. I am the most, uh, most independent in terms of being an equal opportunity antagonist, shall we say, to Republican and Democratic Party leadership. That's because I work for my voters and I work for the people of Arizona. I'm experienced, I'm effective, and I'm a leader, and I have shown time and time again that I can get things done. So I respectfully uh, ask that you continue to support me and send me down there to do the continued, the legislation I have done across so many fields, health, education, behavioral health, and uh, consumer protections, neighborhood safety. There isn't an area I haven't touched. Um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to my fellow Rotarians and have a great day.